we are actually live now should we start yes please go ahead okay great uh hello uh, everyone i am arun founder of uh, janitri innovation uh, janitri is working with a vision to see a world where no mother or baby die during pregnancy delivery and post delivery and uh, we want to make sure that we provide the right technology right innovation at the right time for the right people so janitri varta which is an online digital platform for uh, maternal and child healthcare professional uh, which is a digital learning platform in collaboration with the bsoc bangalore society of ops and gyne bring you know which is a very important aspect of the whole uh, maternal and child healthcare because a lot of mothers and babies die during that phase in developing countries and the numbers are really high so i hope this session uh, will be benefiting a lot for each and every one in that regards i uh, would like to thanks a bsog committee bsogs uh, all the members uh, dr tejavati dr rekha dr sheela dr gayatri dr lata and dr shimati for uh, accepting this particular uh, invitation for intrapartum care and uh, this is very short crisp presentation where we will be covering only two topics and we will be taking the uh, question in last so i hand over to dr tejavati from here uh, very good afternoon to all the participants who have logged in to this uh, webinar and welcome uh, uh, to go directly to the topic of uh, webinar uh, i mean of this webinar i think all of us know fetal heart monitoring is uh, uh, a very important uh, part of the intrapartum care which will guide us in uh, making decisions on time and mode of the delivery without compromising on the uh, maternal or fetal well being in high risk cases yes all of us have a definite plan of uh, management but in low risk in in women who start their labor uh, as low risk and they go on to develop complications uh, like in pre labor rupture of membranes and meconium stain labor where continuous cardiotogography and interpretation of the cardiotogography traces and decision making is very important uh, so to enlighten uh, on this aspect of uh, intrapartum care what's new we have two very good speakers uh, dr latha and uh, dr uh, shrimati and to chair this session we have uh, uh, dr sheela and dr uh, gayatri kartik uh, let me introduce our chairperson dr sheela is retired professor and head of the department uh, of uh, obg uh, Uh, St John's, of course, uh, uh, in no anger she looks retired. Let me assure <laughs> <show> you all, <laughs> she was past uh, president Bangalore Society of Obstetrics and Gynecology and undergraduate and postgraduate teacher for quite a long time. She's got a FICOG to her credit, and her area of interests are high risk pregnancy, endoscopy, and of course research. She has published several articles in national and international levels. and she has been a faculty at various national and international conferences and uh, uh, she was uh, uh, an invited speaker in the international congress of obstetrics and gynecology 2016 to be which was held at uh, barcelona spain in mid, uh, in may 2016 and then uh, welcome dr sheela and the second chairperson we have is dr gayatri kartik uh she has got an uh, diploma in gynecological endoscopy she has been trained in robotic surgery in us she is a senior consultant in manipal hospital and she has been a member of advisory board manipal hospital welcome dr gayatri and i hand over the uh, uh 
uh, you know, not the uh, mic, of course, the session to you all to introduce our uh, speakers and to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tejavati, for that kind introduction. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you. Am I audible? Yes, yes very much. Thank you. And uh, I thank President BSOG, Dr. Tejavati, for uh, giving me this opportunity today to chair this very interesting session on intrapartum uh, care. So, intrapartum care being an integral part of obstetric uh, care has been has seen many innovations and deliberations in applying the labor practices with an aim to improve the maternal and fetal outcomes and the neonatal outcomes as well. So recently in January 2018, WHO has published, uh, brought out a publication, Intrapartum Care for the Positive Childbirth Experience. This is consists of a comprehensive guideline, guidelines rather, on essential intrapartum care, which brings together the new as well as the existing recommendations and when delivered will ensure good quality and evidence-based care for all women and irrespective of the setting or the healthcare level. So this is intended to ensure that uh, giving birth is not only safe, but a positive experience for all women and their families as well. So we have to talks in this session. To start with the first talk, may I request Dr. Gayatri to take over and uh, introduce the first speaker, please? Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Tejavati and Dr. Uh, Sheila for the kind introductions and for handing me this session. We have a very interesting speaker uh, today, Dr. Srimati Raman. She is Lakshmi and Saraswati rolled into one. She has got 10 gold medals 13 prizes and medals throughout her uh, universities uh, and college uh, studies. And no wonder she is an invited speaker and moderator and panelist in various conferences and training workshops. She has several posters and free papers in uh, national and international conferences. Her interests are in maternal medicine, medical disorders and high-risk pregnancy, advanced labor ward management, clinical governance, guidelines and protocols, and medical education. It is not surprising that she has been asked to speak at this kind of a session. Welcome, Dr. Srimati, and we are looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your kind words. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm really humbled and honored to be part of this webinar. Let me thank Tejavati, ma'am, and the associate. Of course, Lata Ma'am and Maru for having uh, arranged this and given me an opportunity. So my talk for today is triaging a necessity. So basically, what is triage? So this starts from the French word triage, which literally means a picking out or a sorting. So if you look at when it was first started to be used, this was way back uh, during the World War before, you know, uh, in Napoleon's time uh, in 1792 as a surgeon in chief. So basically, the whole concept of triage is you sort mass casualties on the battlefield. So it all started from military settings so that they can plan who needs to be looked after first. So if, they, if somebody is walking, then they are fine. If somebody is clearly dead, then they come very low in the priority. So this is the whole concept of triage. So basically, this was then, I know, sort of extrapolated to the emergency department, wherein they made emergencies, priority and non-urgent categories so that we can sort out the care. Because as we can see, the whole goal of triage is you don't want to be doing first come first up. You would rather focus on maximum benefit for that individual person by giving treatment priority. So basically what is triage? It's actually a process. You do a preliminary clinical assessment to then sort the patients before you actually have a full diagnosis because once you sort them out, you would know who needs the priority, who needs the care immediately. So based upon the severity, you then deliver the care to them and you hope to improve their outcomes. Okay, And especially if 
there is a contingent situation wherein we are faced with natural calamities or disasters or traumas, or if it is a resource constrained uh, setting, then this becomes very, very important. So what is obstetric triage? So basically the same concept which has been used in military and in the emergency department, we would want to use it in our labor and delivery units because as we know, that serves as emergency units for pregnant women. So this concept emerged in 1986. Do we need a separate obstetric triage? As we know, uh, our pregnant population, they are a special, I know, sort of special group of people with a specific risk. You know, there are lots of pregnancy associated conditions. We also need a specialized approach because we need to see whether they are in labor. We need to assess not only the maternal, but also the fetal well-being, but also you have specific tests and interventions which might have to be tailor-made for the obstetric condition. Also, whatever, you know, the scales which we have, you know, the triage equity scales would need to be modified. Like how the early warning score, like how the SOFA score has been modified. Even the equity scale has to be modified for the pregnant population because there are lots of physiological changes which happen. They may have some slight hypotension. They may be tachypnic. They may have slight tachycardia. So whatever triage scale we have has to be modified in the obstetric population. So do we need a triage? How many you know, visits do, can we expect? So this is sort of um, you know, rough rule of thumb. And basically what they say is, this can exceed the delivery numbers by as much as 20 to 50%. So this sort of gives us a rough guide to plan the triage area. Okay, so, and this is an interesting study which was done in America. They wanted to look at the average daily obstetric triage volume. And as you can see, it sort of remains constant over the weekend as well. And as you can see in the weekend, more number of people do come in the weekends and in the nighttime. And I think that is sort of, you know, self-explanatory. So triage has to be serviced 24 by 7 because you would expect more surge during the weekends and during the out of hours time wherein they're going to be least prepared. Why do women visit triage? This can be because of various reasons. As we can see, majority, sort of 50% is for a term labor. Roughly one in four is because of a suspected preterm labor. Obviously, we have other emergencies like bleeding. It might be an eclamptic seizure. Or it could be because of decreased fetal movement, abdominal pain. Of course, a small minority in situations like trauma, or it could be a natural disaster. So this is a frequency of presentation which we generally expect in an obstetric triage unit. Right, so what basically do we do? We, like in any other triage, what you are saying, we do an initial assessment and then make a decision regarding their priority. Who needs to be seen first? And obviously, you look at your own facility, see if you're equipped to handle these women. So if you're not able to handle these uh, women, you might have to transfer them to an appropriate facility. All of these things is part of the initial triage. So why do we need this? This is because if we do not have a proper triage, probably the one who needs an emergency care might be seen. But you know, the level two, level three, there can be a bit of a confounding and there can be an unnecessary delay in caring for these women. And any delay in care could be associated with increased mortality and mobility. And of course, we are in the age of uh, litigation. So we are always worried about the ever, you know, sort of uh, pervading threat of medical legal issues. So even for that, this strategy becomes very, very important. Of course, you know, if you have a clear set plan, that you know, you are in the red category, you'll be seen immediately, you are in the green category, so your priority is less, so you would be seen in such and such a time. So it avoids patient dissatisfaction and makes them, you know, look at the waiting times in a more realistic way. So how do we then triage? Two critical questions which we need to answer is, is she sick or is she not sick? Is she in labor or is she not in labor? How do we answer these questions? So for sick or not sick, we look at the mother and the fetus. And as always, obstetric paradigm, mother comes before the baby. So look at the maternal well-being and you go for the fetal well-being. Next, to answer the question of labor, most important determinant is the gestational age because you would want to know whether you can actually accommodate her in her facility. Of course, there are lots of other complaints which can mimic or can sort of initiate labor. So that would be the, uh, you know, sort of your goal. First, you see that the mother is stable, the baby is stable, and then you find out whether she is in labor or not. Okay. So now, yes, this sounds very simple and it's probably very practical. And this is what we probably do in our day-to-day -day setting. But 
what the American college has found that if you use a validated tool, this makes it much better in terms of how you give the care. The quality and the efficiency of the care is much better. There are various acuity triage scores which have been uh, you know, sort of tried. These are the common ones. I'm going to highlight a few of those. There are three which originated from North America, one from Europe, uh, and the other one, it was from Switzerland, and it was um, you know, sort of uh, trialed in Geneva. And all of these um, you know, acuity scores have been validated in trials, and they've been found to be successful. So maybe we can use this as a background and form our own acuity tool based upon the setting in which we practice. So this was the first, this was an obstetric triage acuity scale. This was based on the Canadian triage acuity scale. So basically they have five levels. They have level one, level two, level three, level four, five. And level one is an immediate care. You want to see the patient immediately. Whereas if you go to level five, it's a non-urgent and you would want to see the patient within 120 minutes. All of these are color coded and they also give you the time before which they should be seen by the healthcare professional. It also tells about the reassessment criteria. And so basically, you have specific acuity scales based upon the gestational age, early pregnancy, late pregnancy. You also have one for postpartum. So you have actually the initial acuity scale, which is based upon the history. So basically, is she coming in labor? Is she having any bleeding? So you look at a few salient features, and then you triage them based upon the level they come in. So for example, somebody you're thinking that the cord has come up, then that could be level one. If somebody is saying, I'm having contractions and it's about five minutes apart, then she would come in the level four. But then what they also say is you should need to have modifiers. What are these modifiers? These are basically the hemodynamic stability and the respiratory stability, and of course, the fetal well being. So, as we said, maternal well being and fetal well being comes paramount, and of course, then comes labor. So, as we can see here, the maternal well being look at a hemodynamic status, look at a respiratory status. So, you modify. Say, for example, somebody is in level four. She is coming in with contractions more than five minutes apart. You then look at what is happening. So if you think she's fully and pushing, then she goes automatically into level one of the uh, acuity uh, scale. Okay. So I'm not sure whether I'm confusing you, but basically this is like a two part. You first assess them based upon this and you might be able to upgrade their levels based upon these modifiers. Okay. So next is the maternal fetal triage index. This is basically like an algorithm. This also consists of five levels. And basically what it tells us is the patient is for an elective admission. Then they go into priority number five. If not, then you look at whether they have any priority one vital signs, like abnormal vital signs. It's sort of very self-explanatory. It gives you what are the abnormal vital signs. If so, they go into priority one. And what do you do for them? But if they do not fulfill that criteria, then probably then you look at the next criteria. So it's sort of, it's a very easy algorithm to follow. And with a bit of a training, this can be easily implemented. And the benefit is that because it also tells what you need to do for these patients, how are you going to resuscitate them immediately. Similarly, you have the Florida Hospital Obstetric Acuity Scale. This is also a five-part scale. And then you have stat 15 minutes up to 120 minutes. Now moving on to the European, you have two, which is the Swiss Emergency Scale and the Birmingham Scale. These are four levels. Okay, here again, you know, they tell you how quickly they have to be seen. As you can see, this is a Birmingham uh, symptom specific obstetric triad system, a color coded, and they tell you they should be seen immediately. It is an emergency, or they can be seen within 15 minutes. It also tells where they need to be seen. For example, if it is an emergency, they are better seen in the resuscitative area, probably in liaison with an intensivist. So, like that, you know, it gives you very clear guidance as to how you are going to manage these women. Okay, so this is one which has been used in Sierra Leone, which is a adaptation of these scores. Okay, so we can adapt them and adopt them to our individual needs. And we can make them color coded because it makes it much more easier for the caregivers as well as for the patient. If we think four part is very difficult, it might be confusing, and we have the RAG assessment, which is very straightforward. You have only red, amber, and green. Red means immediate. Amber means intermediate lights, how we follow the traffic light system. Green means, you know, that they are not so acute in their presentation. So if it is red, you see them immediately, you stabilize them and do whatever you need to do. So this is the RAG assessment. And again, you can, based upon your priority, you can say which goes into red, which goes into yellow, which goes into green. 
Whereas if it's a tertiary level center, less than 34 weeks may not go into red. Whereas if you are a level one unit UK, maybe less than 34 weeks if they're coming in and labor might go into red. So we can have a scope for modifying this equity scales. Okay, so whatever scores, scales, which we prefer to use, we need to have a structure. If it is color coded, it makes it much better. But it's important that we have a right balance between overestimation and underestimation. We might say, think, you know, underestimation is a main problem because the safety is compromised. But if you look at the contrary, overestimation is also a problem because if you've overestimated and you're going to be putting all your care on one patient, somebody else who actually needs it may not be looked after in a proper way. So both underestimation and overestimation has to be avoided. And this comes with practice. This comes with training. This comes with experience. Okay. So we might say that, yes, having an obstetric triage is enough because all of us would know. But it is always better to have a acuity scale because everybody would be able to speak the same language. We can collaborate with the emergency department because we never know where the pregnant woman, if she's an unbooked woman, she may not present to us. She might present to the emergency department. Or if you have a very good contact with the you know, uh, ambulance services, then we all speak the same language so that you would know. Because you know, they can always call up and say, this is a patient who's scoring red and she's going to come within the next five minutes. So that we would know what needs to be done and we can be prepared. So in that way, this acuity scale plays a very, very important role. And ACOG feels that we should have a triage unit. We should do them on acuity rather than first come, first serve basis. And they feel a triage acuity scale is much better rather than doing an ad hoc triage. Okay. So that is about need for obstetric triage is definite. Two, preferable to have an acuity scale. Now, who is going to perform the triage? So anybody who is trained can perform it. So, you know, uh, the nurses are actually pretty well qualified to do the triage. Obviously, they need to be closely supervised and monitored, and they need to be constantly trained. And of course, we need to have a structured policy in place so that they would know what needs to be done. But a non-physician personnel, one of the registered nurses would be pretty, you know, sort of um, safe to perform the majority of obstetric triage. So I would say establishing obstetric triage is very, very important in any obstetric unit. What we would need to think about is having a dedicated area and how are we going to staff it, who are going to be staffed. And also, I mean, uh, this is something I think which is very, very important because we live in an era of, you know, WhatsApp and, you know, all uh, online. So if, thanks to Corona, we've all become, uh, you know, sort of virtual. So telephone consultations are going to happen. So I think some kind of a risk assessment for all telephone consultations, because again, it is a medical legal problem. So having such things done in the triage would probably be helpful. So there is not a strict recommendation on that, but this is something which we would have to think about how we are going to organize ourselves. So a dedicated area, a dedicated staff, having a structured assessment. And if it is going to be a color-coded system, it makes it much easier for people to follow having strict protocols as to what needs to be done once we have triaged them and having them on display makes it much more easier because it is a repetitive process and it sinks in easily. Of course, constant staff teaching and training and updating becomes very, very important. So this is what we tend to follow. This is a model uh, triage scale. So we have red, orange, yellow, and green, and that is being put up in the triage so that everybody is aware. Red means you see them immediately. Orange means you see them within 15 minutes. Yellow, you see them within an hour. And green, you see them within one and a half hours. So all of us speak the same language and the patient is also aware of it. So it avoids patient dissatisfaction. And we also have set triage protocols, which is both we have a soft copy as well as a hard copy. So that if there is a dog, they can always go back. And the priorities are very, very clear. So if it's red, they're seen immediately. And what becomes a priority? Anybody with a seizure, anybody who's in a shock, anybody with altered consciousness, all of them become in a red category. So they have to be seen immediately. It also gives you some action which needs to be done. You call for help, you put in an emergency line, give them oxygen. So that, you know, whoever is a first responder is able to do this. Similarly, we have, um, you know, uh, what needs to be done with an orange patient. They need to be seen within 15 minutes and what do you do? And the same goes for yellow and green. Okay, so something which can be developed in our own obstetric units based upon our setup, based upon our unit, uh, you know, patients' attendances, we can sort of tailor-make it. Why do you do this? 
because the main idea is to improve uh, you know the patient safety and improve the outcomes because if you do an incorrect assessment you are obviously going to increase the mortality morbidity medical legal issues okay and of course it's a documented record and you can make sure that you comply with the standards of care it avoids any mistakes being done with the constant updating and constant training of course you know clinical governance obviously it is a major um, you know uh, it's of major importance so though clinically it is going to be helpful audits on these helps us plan how are we going to frame our policies what do we need to do say for example if you see that you know we are having lots of patients coming in particular time and we are having difficulty in triaging then we can go back and see hello Am I, Dr. Shreemati, we can't hear you. Oh, yeah, I think something happened. I think the network, network issue. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry about that. I can hear you now. It's coming now. I think, uh, I mean, you were able to hear till this, isn't it, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically, this is the whole idea of doing an audit. Because we can plan how do we want to uh, do our policies. So for that, also, it becomes very helpful. So to summarize, what i would say is having an obstetric triage is mandatory we need to plan based upon our setup where do we want to keep the triage area it's preferable if it's in the labor adjacent to the labor room because we can then shift them quickly to the labor area having a designated train staff thinking about what kind of an assessment scale we are going to have probably a structured assessment a color coded one which might make it much more easier having a fully equipped triage making sure we are prepared to deal with all emergencies having policies and protocols and having them on display and having constant training so that people are aware of it having in collaboration with an emergency department so that they are also aware of what happens in triage and two important points that you wanted to bring up which may not be applicable to all scenarios is the gestational age cut off this might vary based upon the nicu because if you are a fully equipped tertiary level nicu this may not be a major problem But if you are in a level one center, you might have to think about your gestational age cut off. Also, if you have a separate obstetrics and a separate gynae unit, you might want to think about where your gynae or an early pregnancy or a postpartum woman comes in. But I think it is important that we all work towards having an obstetric triage. I'm sure all of us have obstetric triage, but putting some thought about having a structured assessment and having policies in place, I think goes a long way in improving the maternal and fetal care. Thank you, ma'am. Fantastic, uh, Dr. Uh, Srimati. You have um, made such a complicated topic so easy to follow. Um, I think it is very essential that uh, uh, we uh, develop this triage for every hospital. I still remember uh, uh, when I was an intern, uh, there was a patient who came who was sitting quietly in the corner. And um, as a rule, we generally tend to see multis first because they are shouting and you send them. And she was a primary and she was barely 20. So I said, okay, you wait, you wait. Finally, when I came to her, she was fully dilated. <laughs> and so it just tells you that these are things which are very important. That was just a primary, but then you can miss, uh, you can have major mishaps if you miss these okay. things. Thank you, ma'am. I don't but think that's an excellent a presentation, uh, Dr. Srimati. And I agree with Dr. Gayatri that uh, we all should move towards obstetric triaging. See, though we have in our emergency departments a very structured and clear guidelines for triaging, we don't have the same in our obstetric units, though it serves as an emergency for our obstetric patients. So I think it is we all should move towards the triaging. And you have given us an overview of how we can do it, who can do it, and it's really an excellent presentation. Thank you for that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on to the, we'll take the questions at the end of the session. No? So yeah. we'll move on to the next talk. <clears throat> yeah, and to deliver the next talk on intrapartum care, we have uh, none other than Dr. Lata Venkatram, 
So she is such a well-known personality. I don't know really whether she requires an introduction, but it is my pleasure to introduce her. She is the lead consultant at Bang Rangadurai Memorial Hospital, the past president of BSOG and the president Bangalore RCOG Trust. She is faculty and research guide at you know, Vyasa past, uh, and uh, past president of BSOG, as I already mentioned. She is a national expert on diabetes and pregnancy, uh, trustee, doctors for Seva, so on and so forth. She has done a lot of work, this, especially this intrapartum care and antipartum intrapartum care. So her special interests are, uh, she has developed a mobile platform based application for the antenatal intrapartum and postpartum care. The medical disorders in pregnancy is her special interest, yoga and pregnancy, vaginal surgeries and community obstetrics. She has many awards to her credit, CNN IBN India positive award for reaching out and Yuva Foxy Oration Award 2002, BSOG President's Oration Award 2006, and Sagar Award for Quality Outreach Services. So on and so it goes on, the list goes on. So over to you, Dr. Lata. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Um, I'm quite embarrassed that you introduced me in such an elaborate way. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Arun Teja, for uh, having us. Uh, hello, Dr. Gayatri. Hello, Dr. Rekha. Such a pleasure to see you. Haven't seen you for ages. Um, can I see you. <laughs> yeah. Um, probably, can you allow us to share the screen? Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Intrapartum monitoring. How can we change? Should we change? Is the topic, <clears throat> uh, I would say, a very interesting topic. Um, and I just pondered about a few points. Are we doing the right things in the intrapartum period for our mother and fetus? See, if you looked at maternal mortality, why is it still continuing? Because most of the deaths, unfortunately, are occurring around labor or within 24 hours postpartum. So can we prevent these deaths by improving our intrapartum care and also the postpartum care? The three delays continue in spite of many efforts and also importantly during the intrapartum period. Delays in recognition of risks, timely transfer, and getting comprehensive care. Recognition of the risks depends on who is giving the care, how they are caring for the baby and the mother, and whether they are able to recognize the problem and organize timely transfer for her to be uh, delivered in a safer place, and whether that um, uh, uh, referral center can give a comprehensive care to the woman. All these three have to be improved upon continuously if we have to bring down the maternal and perinatal morbidity and mortality. Why should we be monitoring a woman in labor? So it is to assess the maternal well-being and also to assess the fetal well-being that's identifying the signs of hypoxia before it is too late and causing a neurological damage to the baby. Assess labor progress. These are the three intentions that we have when we talk about intrapartum monitoring. So are we happy with the intrapartum monitoring that we have, both for the mother and for the fetus? Most of the monitoring is quite subjective. Even interpretation of CTG is fairly subjective. And so subjective means it is observer dependent. So in busy labor wards, I mean, we know very well that many times, I mean, the morning uh, uh, blood pressure chart is written now 120 by 80. 
and also FHR is continuously um, being recorded as 140, 150, and things like that. Or the blood pressure is continuously recorded as 120 by 80, even during labor. Most of the time, unfortunately, the staff fill the partogram retrospectively. It is not to be used like that. And it's so very sad that we miss out on important maternal and fetal aspects of um, uh, developing problems or um, I would say monitor, I mean, surveillance, if we did not do it as real time. Of course, busy labor wards, I can understand women. Uh, and also it is not the um, monitoring facilities that we have is not very observer friendly, neither doctor friendly, nor nurse friendly, nor women friendly. Okay, so we need a lot of improvements in intrapartum care or monitoring. So there is no real time relay of parameters. You cannot be sitting next to the patient as doctors or in busy labor wards as staff. And, it, and many procedures are invasive, including vaginal examinations. And also tying a lady to the bed, I would say invasive because it affects the dignity of care of a woman. And also these are prone for error in judgment, especially if somebody is overworked, they might not care to do the surveillance properly. Coming to the difficulties in fetal monitoring particularly, there can be a poor signal quality, there can be interruptions in electricity, inadvertent maternal uh, um, heart rate monitoring, Birth positions, sometimes it can be difficult. If the lady is uncooperative, you might not be able to sort of uh, um, put a CTG monitor on her. So monitoring in second stage, oh my goodness, with ladies who do not have epidural, many of them can be very uncooperative. Monitoring in operative deliveries can also be quite difficult. And it's also important to understand the pathophysiology in fetal monitoring. Otherwise there can be lots of errors um, in interpretation also. Well, what about the lady? If she is supine and tight to bed, how long can she go through labor? It leads to the women's distress and the obstetrician's distress, and she invariably ends up having a section. So many, many times they end up having a section if they are unable to be monitored, especially high-risk uh, women. Um, we all have experienced that if we are not happy about the uh, monitoring, we would rather get the baby out, isn't it? So. Mm -hmm no mobility, especially like this, if she is lying flat on her back. I mean, first of all, how are we going to monitor this lady? Yeah, can, uh, can the um, CTG, that is the cardio or the TOCO pick up any signals? More and more, we are seeing obese women off late. So raised BMI, no mobility in labor, supine and tight to bed, all these are problems that we are facing with the women and also that impairs the progress of labor. Documentation is another big problem that we have. Um, storing the documents is also another problem. Documentation, if not properly done, it is medical legally um, a real sword. Storage, the papers, the CTG papers can fade, the partograms can be sort of lost and things like that. We have had problems um, before with medical legal cases. Um, personally, I have had problems with fading of CTGs and also the partogram paper not being available. So with all this, are we still happy with our intrapartum care, whatever is available today? Uh, for our, not only for the women's and the fetal safety, but for the obstetrician safety also. Are we happy with it? I would say really not. It is still quite suboptimal. Second stage CTG interpretation is very, very important. And also timely intervention is very important. If you are unable to monitor the lady, how safe are we? 
mm, in giving uh, that's why many obstetricians and many women don't prefer to come to second stage at all isn't it mobility there is plenty of evidence to say that mobility especially standing sitting kneeling walking around etc reduces the duration of labor more than an hour actually and also modest reduction in second cesarean section delivery so is it not important that we keep our women mobile should we tie them to the bed because we are worried about the fetus and we want to monitor them with the ctg available now okay i mean at present which ties her really down to bed well posture is very very important upright positions yeah you might not be able to get proper signals if the lady is in upright position especially if she is obese left lateral positions etc difficult with the present ctg monitors which are available second stage of labor especially without an uh, epidural analgesia i've told you upright or lateral positions can be very very difficult and it would be we, we will be constantly worried about whether the baby is doing all right or not um so basically to summarize we lack proper monitoring um well both technology wise and also personnel wise personnel wise in the interpartum period which can lead to delay in recognition both maternal and fetal complications and documentation especially pathograph is not very well maintained as i said so we might be giving the woman a suboptimal care especially if she is in peripheral areas where a transfer might be required if problems were to be there there is no real time transfer of the data so we cannot be having the luxury of sitting at home and making sure that a lady in the uh, um, labor ward is laboring all right which is very unfortunate that's why we get ex ex uh, get exhausted as obstetricians and also the section rates also go up because of the anxiety or the fear whether the lady is doing all right mother is doing um, or the baby is doing all right and also our staff and also junior doctors are not adequately trained to even interpret um ctg graphs so if only there were to be a real time transfer of data it would have improved or brought down the section rates and also improved the care during labor multiple viewers opinions are not possible and if we are not confident about something we could immediately ask our colleagues to have a look at it but that's not easily uh, doable at the moment back end data especially for research purposes audits etc etc you know that we are quite backward unfortunately in our uh, though there is plenty of um, uh, clinical cases unfortunately the research data is still scanty from our country storage um unfortunately um due to medical legal problems the number of years that we have to store these papers are quite variable but are getting longer and longer so medical legally if not documented it is not done and a special word of caution regarding documentation if not documented it is not done because the litigations are going up in our country in obstetrics so that's why people are fearing to give intrapartum care during labor so many of them are not even allowed to go in for labor so um it reflects the core documentation reflects the quality of care and it is important that we have proper documentation so how do we go about it how do we better the quality of our intrapartum care i think technology is a great savior we should use e partogram e ctg and turn on the mode to e documentation since we are all falling in line with technology especially with online um or virtual uh, consultation virtual uh, um what can i say the sessions etc etc i don't think we should fear e documentation that is e partogram and e ctg so it should be a centralized it could be a centralized monitoring like this we have we should we have moved away 
from our pinnant stethoscope even dopplers etc cetera, etc cetera, to sophisticated technology and we should be using it in our labor wards advances in monitoring we should decentralize the care optimize the care but we should centralize the decision making where the seniors can be involved in decision making that's what makes a difference so fourth stage of labor how many of us document fourth stage of labor i think a good partogram should include even the fourth stage of labor we are very fortunate to have arun with us um i mean um, uh, you you might say that there is a uh in a vested interest in this presentation but it doesn't matter because he is one of the one, first ones who has developed low cost um, ctg machines uh, from genitri and also has popularized e partogram so it genitri uh, actually the e partogram is called as daksh which is very um nurse friendly and also doctor friendly and it there is a real time relay possible so unfortunately as i said more than 90% of staff nurses do not fill the partogram during the labor period and it's always a retrospective document most of the time retrospective documentation so if we have to improve then it has to be a real time um marking of the data and also it should be a real time fetal maternal surveillance it is a fairly the uh, ctg monitor it's not a bulky one at all it is a small device which hangs to the neck of the woman and also there is a single um probe um which monitors not only the toco but also the fetal heart and also it gives the maternal heart also we can see this this is the graph obtained by genitri i mean sorry the um, care um, they call it as care ctg monitoring um, so this is the maternal this is the fetal so you know that you are not monitoring the maternal pulse and also this is the toco which is a decent graph and it is yeah to compare the traditional ctgs and genitri the traditional ctg or ultrasound signals that's why there is lot of signal drop etc cetera, etc cetera. these are electrical signals fetal ecg is converted into electrical signals the toco it's a pressure sensor and most many many times especially if the lady is obese neither fhr nor toco would be optimal so these are again electrical signal and uterine contractions are um recorded by electromyography so even in an obese woman this comes very very handy transducers for fsh fhr and toco positioned and repositioned in our traditional ctg as the baby fetal head moves down we will have to move down the um fhr transducer whereas it is a single patch and it is applied and left alone for the rest of the labor and you may use belt to hold transducers which can be very uncomfortable to the lady but here there is no belt at all it is it just sticks on the maternal abdomen parturion is tied to the machine which is very very unfortunate um here she is free to mobilize still the signals are captured either on a tab or to a centralized monitoring desk transducer damage is the is often a problem and to replace a transducer it's very very expensive whereas here it, they are ordinary ecg electrodes that we use and there is no damage and they can be easily replaced this is a thermal paper usually or a4 print which can be lost or faded whereas here direct viewing and storage on tablet or mobile platform or it could be Uh, directly stored in the cloud so and it can be downloaded whenever we want so um, machines are very bulky and need special trolley and space to park here it is very sleek it is on the mother itself and they are it can be clipped to the bedside also 
but it is there is um, no uh, machine involved machine is not tied to the lady or lady is not tied to the machine real time transfer of data is not possible in most of the cases yeah there was a, this thing uh, produced um, by something called as monica which had this um, uh, electrical transducers Uh, which were placed on the metronome abdomen etc etc but unfortunately it's no longer available in our country and services are also very very difficult to get if somebody is owning a monica machine so anyway real time transfer was not is was possible only with that machine but it is not possible in most of the cases of ctg traditional ctg machine whereas here real time transfer of ctg is all the time all the time you are you can be viewing whether you are sitting in your outpatient or at home or if you wanted the lady to monitor herself at home you are still able to see the ctg so quality of trace can be variable loss of contact etc etc but the loss of contact is not an issue at all here and whether she is in first stage second stage obese or thin or whatever or whatever posture if she if, even if she is upside down and if she is hanging by the window etc etc or squatting on the floor it's not a problem it is very difficult to monitor the obese as i said before uh, with the traditional ctg maternal heart tracing usually not available but in some of the recent machines it is available but uh, the traces are very much comparable we did a study and we said 85% it is comparable but the accuracy can be improved that is that was due to slight reduction in variability or difficulty in interpretation of variability but now it is much better and they have changed the graph pattern also and it is quite comparable the maternal heart tracings are a part of it as i said toco does not reflect the pressure of contraction in the traditional ctg whereas it is since it is emg of the uterine musculature it reflects the pressure of the um, uterine musculature or intracavitary pressure which is very very important if especially in vbac situations the cost is around 1.6 to 7.5 lakhs anywhere between 1.6 to 7.5 lakhs whereas cost is around 35 to 55 thousand rupees no central monitoring in most of the cases here central monitoring is possible very easily no home monitoring and real time relay in most of the things home monitoring possible no data analysis possible data analysis with the rich back end data is very much available instantaneously available so is genitri the perfect uh, or sorry the care the perfect ctg no we can still improvise on it signals usually are better after 32 to 34 weeks it cannot sort of reliably monitor a fetus less than that because of the technological um problems it is battery operated so sometimes if you run out of battery it can be a problem ctg cannot be viewed as a continuous thing on a paper it can be viewed on the desktop but still there are some problems twins not possible at the moment so can we build in ai for this artificial intelligence yes very much possible can we build in stan that is st segment analysis yes very much possible for the care ctg because it is ecg which is recorded and represented as a graph by taking the electrical impulses from the fetus so uh, infant trial obviously ai it's a feasibility but it has not been scientifically shown to improve the outcomes but still if you are having problems with the staff interpreting trace the junior doctors interpreting trace if you are worried about it probably you should be using it you are, i mean using ai in adich which can be built into the care ctg so intrapartum ultrasound assessment of fetal head position um so uh, that is another advancement i have moved away from ctg now so what are the advancements i'm generally talking about the advancements intrapartum ultrasound 
uh, I think for head position, I think it's very, very useful if you are unable to make out the position of the baby, especially there is insufficient evidence to recommend the routine use of abdominal or perineal ultrasound for assessment of station, flexion, and descent of the fetal head in the second stage of labor as it stands today. But if you are in doubt, the pinna, the fetal ear comes uh, very, very handy, even on the scan, not only on clinical examination, but even on scan, because that will tell you about the position of the head. I don't have time to go into um, whether uh, the labor will progress properly or, or whether this baby is going to stuck the angles uh, with way, um, probes are measured and we will have to, I mean, I don't have time to go into the details, but that is also being used, but not, not very useful as it stands and it is quite um, complicated. Okay, carb blood gases, I think it is very, very important that we do carb blood gases, not only to protect our back from, it's, it's a main defense, savior to exclude intrapartum hypoxia and liability, but you can assess whether we have acted correctly, we can introspect and make sure that we improve upon what we have done. And med um, medical legally important to prove that the intrapartum events had not caused this hypoxia is very, very important, okay? So I think it, it should, for all instrumental deliveries, for all emergency sections where the fetal, uh, fetal distress has been an indication or CTG ab abnormality has been an indication, please do card blood. It has to be a venous and arterial sample that we take and interpret. Um, well, more uh, this thing to reduce the um, um, inconvenience for women and also interventions during labor, I was thinking about placing nanosensors. Some basic research is being done by, uh, uh, by us with the IAC people. Nanosensors are one on each lateral lips of the cervix, one on fetal head. After all, labor is the three-point relationship which you keep on assessing with vaginal examinations and even by abdominal examination to a limited extent. So if we can measure this, and if we can be represented on a computer without touching the lady, without doing repeated vagina examination, it goes a long way. And also it would be very useful in diagnosing, ups, detecting obstructed labor, which would be very, very important, especially in peripheries. So this should be the, uh, the future actually, we should be able to sort of uh, have a process and information flow chart from all um, uh, peripheral areas, that is primary health center, FRU, to the district so that we uh, take decisions um, at the right time. And there is no lag in picking up the um, signs, um, danger signs of the mother or the baby. So knowledge process outsourcing, like we have BPOs, I think we should have KPOs. Obstetricians should be sitting here like this and midwives obstetricians should be sitting and advising on emergency care to various parts of country and also picking up problems, facilitating transfers and also making sure that the comprehensive care is given in the first referral unit that the lady goes to. So coordinating emergency rescue team, et cetera, et cetera, will become very, very important features of this KPO. So we are planning to sort of uh, start uh, this KPO in collaboration with the government of Karnataka, which has not come through. It's not easy, as you know, to work through. And it is not easy to change ourselves. So how can you bring a big change in the system? It is difficult, isn't it? So I think the way forward is to exploit technology. If we want to bring in a change, yes, a change is very much required. If we want to bring in a change in the um, way that we have, we are doing our intra, giving our intrapartum care, I think it is important that we exploit technology, use the e-documentation, 
innovate, improve, integrate it to make the mother and unborn safe and also make yourself safe. So decentralize the care with centralized decision making that will go a long way in saving many more mothers and many more babies. So thank you very much for your patient hearing uh, because um, uh, I think it was quite technologically based, but I think it calls for a change in our approach to interpartum monitoring and care. Thank you. Fantastic. It's, we'll it's, unmute, a unmute. Vision. it's a great vision and I hope we are able to be a part of that, Dr. Lata. It's amazing. I think we should uh, be able to enforce this if we all put in it, uh, put in efforts together. Yeah, I know it's difficult handling governments, but I think if it comes from the private, public and uh, other major medical colleges, etc., if you put the pressure on I think we should be able to make some headway somewhere. I think so. I think um, it, it's important. Yeah, that um, to start off with, probably we should um, see how best we can uh, make the intrapartum care in our own units safer. Actually, um, the e um, partogram, e um, fetal monitoring, uh, etc will make it more safer and probably we will be able to give women optimal care, encourage vaginal deliveries, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's important, uh, Gayatri. Um, if have, we can uh, hmm, um, have audiovisual relay from our labor board, it goes a long way. Mm. I was working with the Monica for some time, but we could not integrate it with our HIS. And so now there is another company which is uh, called Fetal Light and uh, we're doing the same thing uh, uh, with that. But uh, like you said, change is difficult. So not everybody is going to accept it uh, so easily. But I'm using it for high-risk pregnancy patients for home monitoring. Home so monitoring, that is, yeah. yeah. Uh, like yeah. obese patients are unable to feel movements um, sometimes uh, they are worried, then we lend it to them. They use it and send it to me twice a day or something, depending on what the condition is. Mm -hmm. it. But then I don't think uh, those are the kind of patients who really need this. This needs to go to the periphery. That's right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lata, that was really a very informative uh, talk. We were also at St. John's Department of OPG was also associated with the study with Janitri. It's almost nearing completion. And uh, we obstetricians, we are always after innovations and uh, devices which uh, pick up the fetal compromise early mm -hmm. and at the same time do not increase the cesarean section rate. So how do you think? Uh, I think Gen Genetri's device is a very attractive proposition for us at this uh, time. So what do you think? Uh, more studies? Actually, I uh, like to add here, Sheila, uh, I think about five, six years back, uh, you know, I think Arun met me first time. <laughs> and from then to now, uh, there have been a lot of features added to his, uh, uh, you know, device. I think uh, we need to, you know, look into this aspect of, uh, you know, fetal heart monitoring. Maybe, you know, we should uh, do some more uh, uh, research work uh, in, uh, in different medical colleges mm -hmm and come out with substantial evidence so that you know we can make it uh, uh, you know as a part of a routine uh, uh, practice what do you think uh, lata yeah very very true teja i think we should do a large multicentric study right agree okay yeah um, randomized control trial and um, uh, publish it in high impact journal then only this can have a very big impact on fetal monitoring and it can change the scenario of fetal monitoring all over the world. And yes. uh, certainly we can use for the lay women in peripheries, which is very, very important as Gayatri rightly said. I mean, we are available in cities at the drop of the hat for them, but yeah, it's so very important to use it 
in that that's where you are losing lives that's where uh, the uh, mortalities and morbidities are occurring are with more use i think the cost can come down and yeah. we can you know we uh, use it wide yeah. uh, wide you yeah. think so i think yeah. we should keep uh, uh, as you say i, I think um, ai building ai into it and also yes uh, stan analysis uh, i mean st analysis into it will also go a long way because we don't have uh, fetal blood sampling facilities in our yes. country and also stan if we can it will pre warn you so that the transverse etc cetera, etc cetera, genuine transverse because there can be um, the specificity and sensitivity uh, whatever you uh, you say for ctg is quite less limited real so time transfer of we power. can add on stan add on uh, some more features ai etc ai i don't know uh, whether it's going to really help but still yeah stan adding stan would be it would go a long way mm, real time transfer of the data is one of the positive very much yeah it should be we should be sitting like bpos <laughs> yes <laughs> they decentralize the care but centralize the decision making right You, it, it's yeah. really difficult with uh, the number of students dropping out of medicine. <laughs> Within few years, you are not going to have people to sit in. You need room. more gadgets and machinery to, you know, work in future. Yeah. And the um, yeah, labor monitoring itself has dissuaded many young uh, doctors taking obstetrics and uh, appro approach to the rural PHCs and all that is uh, really challenging and that can be overcome with your monitoring systems. Yeah. Uh, intrapartum care in many of the hospitals is non-existent because of all these problems. Depending on the um, uh, staff, depending yeah. on uh, yeah the doctors, and depending on our colleague anesthetists, neonatologists, etc., etc. So many people think, my God, it is better safe. Uh, we will be giving a, a lady a safe baby and uh, uh, a safe mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. Making her safe. Anesthetist and pediatrician for the outcome. <laughs> true, true, very true, very true. And Lata, that's why we had to do cord blood to save our cells. That a good asset to the obstetrician is not anybody in any institution is a trained midwife. Very true. <laughs> It comes to that. You know, nobody wants to leave. They give all the incentives to the trained staff who can do PV and inform the doctor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And also the PVs are so very amazing. I feel I have so very amazing patients. Yes. Sort of see how best. So all those are problems um, that we have. I mean, well, from doctor's side, um, women's side, and staff side, if we can sort of bring down quite a few issues that I enlisted, I think, yeah, uh, labor care would be is quite an interesting one which is coming up. The nano sensor no, for. Uh, No, like, I mean it's a long way till the way. I mean they did something it which was not very suitable. Nano sensors are not easy to sort of uh, develop to clip on. It needs uh, ethical approval, um, etc. And also those nano particles, whether it's going to affect the baby and things like that. Lots of questions, lots of words. But it is important. After all, that is a three point relationship that you keep on. Uh, Measuring isn't it, uh, Teja? Do you have any questions for the speaker? Don't any questions? No, we did not receive any question till now. <laughs> They have fully saturated or have gone asleep. Huh? They have fallen asleep. We had a problem in uh, logging in our, our room. Uh, there was some problem in logging in. Yeah, uh, I saw a little late only, and I uh, called up uh, Suchitra and asked her to put the link. They could not log in. Okay. Okay. but this is not um, yeah shemati um i i just want to sort of um you did mention briefly that um i think triaging triaging in um uh, labor ward i mean busy labor wards uh, for example um, government hospitals etc etc could be even done online that's what i feel yeah if they can just share the data we can just prioritize um this remind yeah do we have time for a couple of minutes or yeah another five minutes yeah. yeah another five minutes 
see um the whole concept of this kpo etc etc came to me from uh, by a patient's husband um who said he sits in um, philippines and controls the emergency care in new york i said how do you control it okay yeah he is i mean he um, gets all the emergency calls which need to go to the emergency rooms and he prioritizes and he has got a protocol triaging to uh, they have given him a protocol the new york uh, city whatever health care system or whatever he has they have given him a protocol and he follows that protocol and prioritizes the emergency services including the ambulance and also emergency queuing system etc etc sitting in philippines with only two nurses and his wife who is an mbbs doctor if somebody sitting in philippines can control the emergency care in new york what are we doing we not have why not here absolutely what are we doing what how are we losing our mothers how i mean why should we be losing our mothers or was a very very honest thought that's when all these uh, volley of imaginations yeah comes comes up and some of them have been sort of put into action and i think there is it's a long long way to go but still we should make some beginning and progress so uh i think we should uh, think about it and uh, put our efforts what you said yeah. kp mm. especially i think government set up on all no they have a lot of uh, delivery mm. yeah gayatri so yeah. even if we retire we can be sitting and doing this at home absolutely yeah, you I should tell me that dr lata you already have a volunteer from amritsar dr sangeeta has said they are ready to participate in this research Oh, oh how nice how nice i think teja we should take it up through bsog if we can actually no and so uh, we had a big plan of this yeah. has karun everything yeah. you had to just stop stay still we'll do it virtually teja arun yeah. you provide us free machines no, 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 for bsog no, no, members no, 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 you will be no, no, no. a multimillionaire <laughs> so i am jaffri we are definitely ready to i discuss with you also regarding this uh, kpo model i am i am really excited about this idea and even i have i am you know if you want we can go together and also discuss with dr rajkumar uh, in the maternal health director and you know discuss this yeah. because we are very active in kalburgi uh, district where we have deployed uh, all our application in 60 government hospital including phc chcs and mm. we are planning to scale up more so i think if that angle can also be included would be great yes very nice and we could have some volunteers from bsog who can run the kpo for piloting and mm. then we will see how it goes lata you have a retired person plan of you are you no more retired to sheila either look retired not tired you better you better help us actually then you wanted to start we will follow you very inspiring one i must say so no, actually we did plan you know from a long time we been planning and i was discussing with lata you know something about intrapartum care and uh, if it will hard monitoring i think mm. uh, a good job uh, dr shreem and dr lata and uh, you. you know not on the screen you know practical work mm. in action thank you dr yeah the great job teja as yeah. a uh, uh, i mean president who is going to sort of uh, hand over the medallion do you think mm -hmm. we should give the bsog members some uh, charts which should be hung uh, when i was the president uh, in um, 2006 and 7 we did give pph eclampsia um, charts etc now can we give a triage chart 
sepsis bundle chart oh, and oh, also oh, how to manage anaphylaxis oh, and uh, oh. Jawati's contribution to every obstetrician. Yes, oh, no, that's what I, when I was listening to Srimati, I was just thinking of the same thing, you know. We should have mm -hmm. charts everywhere, especially in the big hospitals. I think uh, we should do that, Dalata. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I think when so. We are, when I'm handing over, we, we can. Charts and the standard yeah. protocols. Yes, yeah, I think so. Yes, we will be helping everyone a lot, you know. Sure. We'll be that's helping fine. all the hospitals. Mr. Yes, Ramesh, please. I think we do have, have a demo of this in Manipal. Huh? Yeah, we Arun? have a demo of this yeah. at Manipal hospital. Yeah, yeah, we can arrange. We can arrange. Just let me I have know. told Arun that after this talk, no, uh, many of them will be interested, and he may get uh, calls. You know, yeah, right. definitely. Or uh, <laughs> giving can, a demo. No? I can just uh, share a very small. Uh, video. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is more for my entire department so that we can teach it. There's no sound. Watch this. features of hardware and then it communicates with an application and the application actually have each and every feature which can make your whole intrapartum process paperless and you can further take the printout of the case sheet and keep it in your record. Uh, for this specifically for the government purpose we have this feature where let's suppose a primary hospital have this product and the secondary and tertiary hospital have this product. And if they refer the patient through our application, so they will actually get to know who is coming from where in advance. So they will be prepared in advance. So for example, if you have the peripheral hospital where the referral is coming during intrapartum phase and both the hospital have the application. So you will actually get to know in real time who is coming from where and the, all the data get transferred. Uh, it, you, it generates automatically partograph. It, it, uh, you can take the printout of case sheet you can view the data in your phone wherever you are and the data will be on cloud so you can take print out at any time you can so you know we also got a request where people actually are comfortable in looking at the data on the thermal paper as well so we have also included thermal paper as an optional feature if you want you can have it so all these things which we have included considering a lot of uh, resources we have done a lot of pilots which we have done specifically uh, with the help of St. John's, Rangadori Hospital, Narayana Health in Bangalore. Uh, so yeah, we will be happy to provide a demo uh, uh, in your hospital. Uh, we will definitely in touch. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Rejavati, over to you. Yeah, um, we will uh, yeah, yeah. Now we have, uh, we have Rekha waiting to Thanks. Uh, yeah, anyone? No, I thought somebody wanted to speak. Yeah, we can uh, probably draft a performance. Who are all in the research? Are you in the research committee, Sri Srimati? In BSOG? Somebody no, no. who is in the research committee, probably. Yeah, we could draft a um, protocol performance and then uh, 
probably we can uh, ask the members if they are interested. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Yeah. She's there, I believe, no? Dr. Gayatri. We can do that. We'll discuss and uh, you know, plan out what to do. Yeah, Rekha. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I hereby extend my thanks to the president, Dr. Tejavati, for giving me opportunity to deliver a vote of thanks. Thanks to Dr. Sheila CN and Dr. Gayatri Kartik for honoring our clinical webinar by accepting to be the chairpersons of today's event. Thank you, Dr. Srimati Raman, for your wonderful knowledge, for your knowledge sharing session where you emphasized on triage, the obstetric triage, need for obstetric triage and its importance and the triage scale. Yes, Lata, of course, the mother and the unborn have to be safe. Also, we have to be safe. Other than that, as obstetricians to continue our career. As you said, uh, that is very important. I would like to uh, extend my thanks to you for your brilliant talk. You explained us about the intrapartum mo monitoring, the CTG, the importance of the documentation, how monitoring and use of artificial intelligence, etc. I thank all the participants for logging in and taking time for us. Thank you, the staff who worked behind the scene and made all the arrangements and made this program a comfortable one. Last but not the least, I thank Jenny3 because they have sponsored this program and we are grateful to you. Jenny3 innovating for saving lives at birth for sponsoring this session. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.